Oh, wow. Okay. All right, Pat. Here we go. Okay. Ready? Ready. So, uh, uh, bonus points for anyone who spots the joke on the title page. Oh, oh, I think I see a joke on the title page. <laughs> what joke? Is that me? I'm it's, the joke? Okay. I think, no, I believe it's summer plus a quarter. There you go. Exactly. I like it. I like it. Oh my goodness, why are we starting with the top reason startup fail? Um, we're actually going to talk about um, development practices and how we go about developing software. That's what the software cycle is about. But don't we, we don't develop software, we just retro engineer it. <laughs> we, 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 there's a lot of startup companies yes. and they are all trying to find a, uh, a product that people uh, could use. Right. And so the number one reason is that there's no market need. That's pretty interesting. And 42%. Well, and, and that's um, that says a lot for how you have to develop software, really. Well, the, the interesting thing there, Bonnie, is that the first book that anyone ever writes is their autobiography. <laughs> and, the, and the first piece of software that you write is software that you think you need, but yeah, you don't and, actually understand the market. Yeah, exactly. Right. Well, and I, I get the sense that you know, the investment, like a heavy investment in developing a product when ultimately you haven't been able to really determine the market need or getting it in the hands of people who could tell you whether or not it was a good idea. That, that's that got to be painful, but also like just so not agile. Right. So, yeah, and, and, and yes, typically these, these, these people, these uh, people run out of fun, out of money, the yeah. first one because they they don't have a need, they can't get investors, so they run out of cash. Yeah. So that kind of covers the top, top two. The top two. Yeah, that's and that's pretty so that's a lot of startups. And I think the idea being here that we're gonna think about how best to develop products even yeah. with you know alongside seeing what the need is, how to react to the need, knowing if you need to pivot, all that kind of stuff. Right. Exactly. And, and what we're going to talk about is how does existing software products work and how do new ones start? Yeah, okay, I like it. Even though Bilbo Baggins gave us a mm -hmm. bunch of baggage, yeah. a bunch of baggage, this is like a clean slate start. Right, so what okay. we want to talk about today is uh, the software process. Uh, and it's very, very, very important that you hear this right now. There is no right software process. Every single company makes it up and they all do it differently. Yeah. And in fact, if you go to Microsoft and there's two teams sitting next to each other, they will have completely different uh, process in place. Do they have shared like code standards or linters or that kind of stuff? Sometimes. And, yeah. and uh, you know, what one team I worked on, one team, they were both building towards the same product. It was in Alexa. One team was working in Rust and the other one in C++. Yeah. And they were all linking together and there was actually a lot of animosity between those two teams, but they were both successful. Yeah, interesting. So team, team personalities can be distinct, but obviously all working towards the same goal of getting the product done. Right. Then we're gonna talk about some of the processes that you can implement. Um, you know, things that help, that we know help. Uh, you don't have to implement all of them. You, there's there's definitely software companies out there that have very little process and they're successful, uh, but they will, they, will, they will struggle. They pay more for their development. Uh, and then we'll talk about the software development life cycle uh, to uh, kind of show you how these things grow over time. So software process. What is the fundamental assumption here? Yeah, you know, I mean, I have the feeling that though this is associated with software process, it's it's really a fundamental assumption associated with the development of anything. Any pro any, <laughs> you know, yeah. you, if, if you do have to have processes, it can't just be really ad hoc. Even starting a Teams meeting ad hoc is really challenging. Right. So you've got to have good processes. And the whole reason there is you learn lessons from making mistakes. You bake into your processes guidance to reduce the risk. 
because you did probably hit that risk and make mistakes before. The processes are like, hey, we're just gonna keep you out of the weeds and keep you moving forward. And even though I'm not a person that really, uh, you know, adheres to a lot of process, I do believe in this fundamental assumption. Right, so, so if I was to say to you, I wanna go to Toronto, mm -hmm. and I just started walking on 12th that way, do you think yeah. I'd get there? Eventually, I believe in you. Do you think there's a better process? <laughs> Well, I'd, I'd maybe encourage you to hitchhike. <laughs> okay, hitchhiking is a good one. Yeah. Is there is there a faster way of getting there? Well, it depends if you want the journey or the um, <laughs> But the journey, hitchhiking could be really fun. But yeah, if the whole idea is to get there as quickly as possible, you better jump on the 787. And we're talking about different processes for getting to Toronto. Yeah. The one is just walking. That's part of a journey. Yeah. Uh, and so the risk of being late for a meeting in Toronto uh, is reduced by choosing the right process. Absolutely. The risk of, you know, not having a fun journey, though. <laughs> well, this yeah, yeah. trade-offs. There are a lot of trade-offs. <laughs> um, so there's, like I said at the very beginning, there's many different software processes or, or tools that you do. But at the end of the day, this, this, this applies to every project that you ever, any creative project. You have to say, what is it that you're going to build? How are you going to build it? How do you know if you've built it? Mm -hmm. And then when you build it, how do you make it better? Yeah, and it, would it be true that in for products that involve a lot of team members, that these might even be separated out into different teams? Absolutely. Uh, you can have, uh, you know, for example, there, there's um, Assassin's Creed, a game from Ubisoft, uh, it takes three years to develop it. It has 800 people. 800. 800 people working on that. And so there is a high level specification of what the game is going to be. Yeah. But then there's the, there's the back end team, there's the metrics team, there's the animation team, there's the AI team, and they all have some goals and they all go through a, kind of a, a nested version of this. So okay, we as the back end team are going to make our back end more effective and we're going to save some money for this game yeah. on the next iteration and yeah. so that becomes their focus in conjunction with the larger one yeah i think especially the step design and implementation i've seen this separated out into different teams for sure right. that the design team and the implementation team are actually sometimes there's a lot of challenges to getting the communication right between those two sets of people sometimes so yeah go at it and, but but the fact that they might look different in different organizations, but these fundamentals are there. So the simplified version of this um, is you, you do the feasibility. Hey, uh, I want to build uh, I want to build some piece of software that allows me to track student grades. Yeah. Feasible. Well, I hope so, because all our students are counting on our yeah. business. I hope it's, yes, but yeah, or, or have feasibility planning, you know, I mean, it can be something that's going to you know, change the world. Like, uh, well, can we really make something like, a, I don't know, ordering pizza accessible for people with low vision? So. Or, or, okay, so at least, but what about if I come to you and say, I want to have instant zero lag communication between here and uh, Beijing. Right, yeah. Is that feasible? You know, it's gonna, you're gonna have to pay a little bit of a price for that. There's gonna be the speed of light. The speed of light makes, it's, means it's impossible. It's, it's gonna be something you have to take into account. But, but in that sort of, you know, I want it to be zero latency. Okay, no, but you can certainly look at it and say, all right, that is a high priority. That's gonna be as fast as possible. Right. Uh, okay. Within our cost. And that's the feasibility part yeah. where you say, okay, well, is what you're asking for actually possible? Yeah. And it may be sometimes that what you're asking for is not possible. Yeah. So but don't tell students that. No, no, no. But no, <laughs> uh, we don't give out assignments that are not feasible. Oh, but, I don't know that I've adhered to that always. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but anyway, one, but, but, but the, 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 the point of this slide is when you're gi given a task, have a quick think about it and say, is this yeah. feasible? You know, yeah. is, it, is, it, is it possible? Uh, and if it isn't, then that's the time to go and say, this is, you, your requirements are wrong. Uh, what you're trying to do is wrong. And then once you negotiate on that, because every step of this pipeline costs money. Oh yeah. So if you can stop a project 
at the very beginning that's impossible, you won't waste a lot of time building, trying to build something that's actually impossible to build. But not really just impossible to build, but impossible based on the budget you have. That's correct. You know, if you had an infinite amount of money, it might be possible. But given you're a small startup and this is what you have, yeah. uh, it's not feasible given your resources. That's correct. And then we go to requirements and then design and implementation. And then we go operational maintenance. This looks like a one-way flow, but we'll see that this closes into a circle after a while. So uh, chaos management. What, what is chaos in the context of software development and Yeah. Oh, I can see chaos coming in in many time, many places. But I, I really think that it's sort of that, you know, there's all these things that are, are marked as changing here on this side of the slide. But I actually think that, that it's not only just that at each layer things are changing, it's that the, the, the combination and between the layers, things are changing too. So I think like it's like, I think this is a clear picture of what, where the chaos can come in. But then I also think it cross cuts a lot of these layers. Right. So it can, and you know, personalities come into play, personalities of the client, of the team, of the, of the communication, yeah. all of these things. But, but these are clear right here yeah. that, that we can talk about these three, that the product definition, this is from the client's point of view, and certainly the customers, when we're trying to say what's feasible, you know, in terms of, and, and how we might be able to, um, I think that first slide that said, there's no market for it. Well, you know, maybe there was a market, and now there's not a market, and how do you test that? Um, and of course, technology is changing all the time. So yeah, trying to manage all of this. Holy cow. And so, so um, if, I, if I were building a large building, is the technology for building large buildings changing that quickly? Maybe not as much as what we're talking about here with software. Well, it's, sure. it's, it's probably not going to change halfway through building a building. Hopefully not, I eh? I think so. Yeah. Um, so, Change is constant is one of the things you'll hear a lot in software, that customers change their mind, your product manager changes their mind. Um, and when you're working on a project, you can look at a situation and say, how often do I as a developer have to react to change? Yeah, oh my gosh. I'm because if, 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 I, if you give me a task and it takes me six months to do it and you're not gonna change your mind, then I can work away for six months to do it and deliver it. Yeah. But that's not are you going to change your mind about it? Oh, am I ever going to change? Especially, especially if I can't picture this um, calculator spreadsheet thing, but I know that I kind of want it because I want these students to learn how to use a spreadsheet, but I can't really picture how you're implementing it. And then you show me what you've done. Now you've given me a starting point to really dig into what I want. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, oh, yeah. So that really accelerates the change once I've seen that prototype. And so what we need to do is embrace that chaos. We need to, we, it, it, it's not going to go away. Like when, when I'm sitting there coding, something's going to change tomorrow when I come into work. Uh, hopefully not tomorrow, maybe four days from now. So how do we go about embracing this chaos? Yeah. Anticipating it sounds like a good idea. Okay. And not even just from your clients, but from your bosses, right. your managers, right? Your manager could come in and say, so it might not be a small startup that you're talking about. You're talking about a large organization, but you had an idea of what to do based on yesterday's meeting. Today's yeah. meeting, it's different. Okay, so let's leave that one for a bit. We'll okay. come back to it. Yeah. But let's go back to this kind of process of uh, requirements, design, and implementation. So we'll go back forward here. So this idea of uh, specification is, uh, you know, the feasibility, the requirements, gatherings, and analysis. Now, Yvonne, you, you keep talking about personas. Yeah, I love personas. How does personas, how does, how does this fit into uh, the whole specification part. Yeah, I I really feel like um, personas are a stand-in for real customers. You know, ultimately, feasibility studies would involve real people. Obviously, you can do that with a lot of data, just to, to sort of uh, uh, get the idea of whether or not the product would be something that people would use. But then you need to think about 
the different types of users. And that's where I think this really comes into play. And, and, and I think it takes a lot of creativity to be realistic about what some of these personas might be bringing to the table in terms of how we might set up the requirements for the system. Mm -hmm. I think that there's, uh, again, we all have our own biases and we sort of see things. I think you said, you know, the first um, thing you write is an autobiography. Yeah, it's always, you know, we all, our, our world starts with us and expands out. Yeah. You know, that's just the way we are. And you want it and you can, you get really excited about it because you're like, isn't this the coolest thing ever? But if you've created a persona that would be basically opposite land to you and they would be like this is the most complicated and absolutely um unintuitive interface or whatever it is uh that i could ever imagine that's going to really help you so, but but really if you could have real people and that's what i think a lot of these feasibility studies are about if you're talking about uh the people part of things um uh, then that's going to be even better than these personas. But this idea of really doing the technical and financial analysis, um, thinking about what the uh, system stakeholders might want. I mean, that's a lot of talking to stakeholders, um, making sure that you nail this in detail and that you're uh, able to go back and make sure that all these requirements are really have this sort of level of validity um, that give you that starting point especially if it's a startup. Right. Yeah. So if, I, if I'm a junior engineer and I go work for Amazon, how much of this stuff do I actually have to do? Yeah, I kind of feel like junior engineers, but you can tell me better than I can tell you, actually are going to be given uh, implementation tasks more than this level of determining whether or not we go this route. It's, so uh, if you're starting as a junior engineer, would it be reasonable to ask for all of this stuff on your project? Oh my gosh, I think that's a great idea. I don't know if that happens a lot, or does oh. that is that sort of asking for um, more information than maybe even your manager has? Well, it actually shows a desire to understand the business and to grow. Uh, I haven't worked with a single manager in my career who would be upset by that question. Nice. They would they would look at you as a junior engineer, going, hmm. I see this, yeah, and then then you become special. So so ask for this stuff. So if you're starting a startup, yeah, you got to do all this stuff. But a lot of you are going to be working for uh, large companies, and you you should expect this kind of feasibility to have happened before they tell you to start coding. Yeah. Oh, nice. And and that there would be here's one thing, there would be artifacts associated with this that you can look at that really allow yeah. you to understand it. The other, you know, when we're saying startups and large organizations, maybe we should also mention the, you know, you're going to help out a nonprofit organization. This is where this feasibility study in terms of technical and financial, in yep. particular financial, because nonprofits don't have yep. money. Yep. That is like, you got no money. How are you going to do this? So those, keeping those three things in mind, be looking at these from those different uh, perspectives, I think that's exciting. Well, and, and, you know, the artifacts, for example, at uh, Amazon, every single project starts off with a press release FAQ, a PR FAQ. Okay. So you can ask and say, can I see the PR FAQ for this project? Nice. And it's the press release that says what's going to be announced. And then in the FAQ, there's all sorts of questions like what technology is going to be built on? You know, how much is this going to cost per user? So the first, the, the PR is a press release, which is one page long, and the FAQ is about 76 pages of details. Oh. Right They're on. Amazing documents. Well, now I can see, holy cow, asking for that and getting that scope would be amazing. And you know, and you and Microsoft, Microsoft and Google all have similar type of processes. Yeah. Because uh, even though it's a large company, every new project is treated like a startup. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exciting. So then we talk about software design and implementation. So you go through here and we go, okay, let's do it. Okay. Yeah. Now what you need to do is go in here and say, okay, now that I understand the specification, I need to make a program that actually works. Yeah. And I, what I love about this and what the, the students that we're working with right now um, are experiencing is kind of the um, uh, retro engineering, the design from the implementation. 
which again, this understanding this process uh, means that you can understand it forward or reverse. That's correct. <laughs> and being able to go both ways like this is going to be so great for our students. So I'm yeah. very excited. And I'm glad that it's pointed out here that, gosh, they're interleaved because that's right. You know, sometimes you've got a partial implementation and you got to be able to think about how the design incorporates that or you really don't have any information on the design or you have all design and no implementation. Yeah. And, and it depends on the size of your team. Um, you know, we're talking about this in the context of software engineering, but it could very well be that you actually have a full-time designer on your team yeah. and they are not a computer scientist. They're actually a human factors trained person that understands how people interact with software. Absolutely. And they're going to help you as an engineer make the right decisions. So that partnership is really, really tight. Oh my gosh. And I know some of the, the so some stories from some great uh, products from Microsoft in particular and Microsoft designers working with the engineers and how some of that goes. It's fascinating. And, and there's certainly debates. Oh yeah. Well, it, because there is no right way to do it. Yeah. There's the best we can do with the resources we have right, right. now. And then we're going to try again tomorrow. Yeah. And that whole, the designer says, for this persona, we need this. Right. And the implementer goes, that's not really feasible right now based on how our system is built, but we yeah. can give you this. And they're like, no, this persona needs this. And no, oh boy, that's exciting. So for, for the next assignment, we have asked you to do some design. Yeah. We've asked you to add some extra buttons. Yeah. And we've asked you to design a front page where you can select your files. Yeah. We actually don't know the right way to do that. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> we would not be the people no. to ask. But but so so think about it and, and use that. And again, it if you choose two or three different designs, document them, take screenshots, mm -hmm. so that when you're talking about it later, uh, you can, in particular, if you're going for interviews and when you want to talk about this team project that you did, you can show, we tried this, we tried that. Yeah. And these are all things. Again, these are closely interleaved. Yeah, you need uh, to be able to do the assessment of the trade-offs between different approaches. Oh right. my goodness, it's this beautiful design activities. Right. So. Uh, Okay, so we now have the software. We're going to do this. So what do we have to do? Software design. Well, what do we need to do? The interface design, uh, this is, uh, you know, this whole, there's a four-year undergrad that gets you there. And you don't, it's not a computer science degree. It's, it's, it's okay. user interface. Uh, but they're, they're saying here, interface design, where you define the interfaces between system components. They're not even talking about the HCI. I yeah. <laughs> but I agree with you. There's a whole HCI element that I think I would call interface design, oh, yeah. but it's also interfacing between yeah, yeah, components. Exactly. So yeah. we have all these, these uh, terms that we keep throwing around, and they all mean different things. Uh, but basically, exactly. we, we need to, you need to know where you store your data, how you're going to separate this into different pieces of code, in particular, if you're large teams. You know, you talked earlier about, uh, we talked about um, Assassin's Creed. Mm -hmm. And in order for 800 people to work on a project, yeah. you can't all have them checking into the same code base. Yeah. Because your merge is going to be crazy. Uh, and the architectural design, are you running on Azure? Are you, are you doing a, a microservice? Are you doing a monolith? Uh, how is all this? There's, and there's nothing wrong with doing a monolithic application. In fact, most startups start as a single application, and then if they become successful, oh, yes. then they have the money to split it up yeah. because now you're going. You have two, three, four teams. The the first split is usually the front end and the back end. Yeah. So now we have a front end and a back end team. Uh, sometimes you you divide things by product. So you'll say, okay, you're going to be the data ingestion team. You're going to be the data processing team, and you're going to be the reporting team. Yep. And you'll have front end and back end in both of those. Uh, and those architectural designs impact the way that you, where, how you seat your teams. Yeah. And it's hard. I mean, we're going to ask you guys to, first of all, retro engineer some stuff and then also uh, uh, roll forward with ideas as well. And this, this sort of distinction between what's an architectural de design when we're saying that the interface design is where 
you know, we, we uh, are looking at the interfaces between these data elements. So there's sort of the highest level subsystems, and this modularity comes into this in a mm -hmm. big way. And we've talked about modularity a couple times, but we're talking about, especially as you're saying, this decomposition is really something that's used to be able to separate out teams. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's not even so much about like exactly what functionality is going well. It's more about what group of people are going to be working on each one of these things. It does divide itself into functionality, but still there's kind of, it's the motivation behind it is interesting. Um, and I think this this last point here, this database design, and I think this idea of, you know, the data structures and how the database works. A lot of times it's just sort of a, a given that there's going to be a database back there. But there's, there's a lot of intermediary kind of data structures that can be used when caching information or maintaining some information that become very interesting at that level. And right. I think the students have started to see that too, for sure. Yeah, and one of the, one of the mistakes I mean, that people make is they make a, a, a large SQL database with multiple yeah. tables and they do relation, which is fine for the beginning of your project, but it becomes a bottleneck in the future as 10 teams are trying to change the schemas of those different databases. Absolutely, and maybe that's where no SQL kind of started to get uh, hit the scene a bit. Um, so software validation, you built something, you want to make sure. So there's two aspects here. There's verification and validation. Yeah. What's the difference? Yvonne? Well, I kind of feel like um, they're, they're sort of layered here in a way that at the higher level, we do talk about uh, verification in the sense of, you know how we went through all that slide on requirements, feasibility study. And blah, 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 blah. So verification is about making sure that we're hitting those and checking those off. But that validation piece, I feel like that's where it really comes into these test cases. and the type of coverage our students can get using wonderful tools now that not only do the unit testing, but, you know, integration testing and all this, that validation is, uh, this is a whole new generation for validation, I think, relative to where I saw mm -hmm. validation. So now, remember that first slide where 42% of the teams failed because they had no customer? Yeah, need? there was no market. You think they did verification? Oh, good point. I feel like that's exactly what I think that's where they missed Verification it. comes in, making sure there's a market for this product. Yeah, because, it, because look at it. It says to deliver all the functionality to the customer, but if you don't know who your customer is, yeah. how do you know that you're building the right thing? Yeah, and yeah. For clearly 42% of those people, those teams didn't. Really did. And and maybe there's also something that, you know, just foreshadowing where we're going here, that this is changing. This is always changing. So you're going to get a few of the top level specification pieces verified. Right. Then you're going to start to implement and you're going to start to iterate on this. Oh, yeah. And really, I think the, the power, again, that, that our students have now with Pilot chat GPT and the things that you've shown me is that there's there's no excuse for not having very extensive validation of your software now. Yeah. Okay, the real debugging process. <laughs> uh, yeah, so basically, locate error, design error, repair, repair error, retest program. This is how the whole world kind of operates. You're like, oh, got it, got it done. Yeah. Thank goodness. Uh, but this is what should actually happen. Oh, look at you getting a test in there. So you typically, nice. and, and this is what you'll, you'll hear regression testing. But basically yeah. whenever you find a mistake in some code, clearly your test didn't catch it the first time. So you write a test such that if that error ever gets introduced again, you now can test against them. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's so, a really nice catch there. So but, if you're under pressure, this is what you're going to do. Yeah, and again, this is why these processes are so important. It's like you got to try to reduce risk. How are you going to redu reduce risk? Have a process that says this is what we're going to do. And I think, you know, we ask the students to do this, um, you know, just sort of go through a, an example, writing up a bug report. And I think you know that's another uh, artifact that helps capture 
this whole, all of these dimensions of software that we did hit an error and here was a report and now we write a test and right. now we, you know, yep. yeah, yeah. And, and we'll, we'll be, uh, we'll be, uh, we've done a whole bunch of work on, on kind of unit testing uh, for the software, but we haven't talked about testing the user interface. Oh. And so we will be talking about that, about how to use React and Jest for uh, actually simulating a user interacting with it. Yeah. Uh, because a lot of the bugs, like that bug that we had in, in, uh, in the program where there's no pop-up, yeah. um, you could have a test that says, if the user isn't defined, you push any button, it pops up this alert. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think some of the students found some Recent research papers, even about devising new methods to be able to test GUIs and yeah. stuff, which is pretty obviously a big challenge. Yeah, my, my favorite uh, UI tester is uh, the Amazon Devices team, where they have warehouses full of actual uh, iPhones and they have little robots that tap them no, for you. Don't. Yeah, for, uh, Alexa has those as well because you need to be able to run these tests automatically. So they have that. Whoa. <laughs> okay. I get that picture of me at work. There you go. I just sit next to you all the time. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of code out there. There really is a lot of code. Uh, I, 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 the most that I ever worked on was 58 million, no, 5.8 million lines of code on, the, on a video game engine. Uh, but for example, the Chevy Volt has 10 million lines of code. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, Android has 12 to 15 million lines of code. And Google, Google, their whole back end. They have all of their, all of, all of Google has one GitHub repository. Wow. Not, not one GitHub repository, one GitHub server uh, that yeah. they, they have different repositories in there, but it's yeah. all there. Uh, the nice thing about being at Amazon is I could go look at any code, except for secret projects, I could go uh, look at any code from any of the Amazon services. It's kind of cool. That is very cool. And then you can see the name of the person that wrote that code, and if they're still working at Amazon, you can ping them and say, hey, say how does this work? Yeah, oh, wow. Yeah, that's a good, that's, that's a lot of good communication through a corporation, for sure. Yeah, but the point of this slide is actually the picture on the right. Yeah. Uh, Can't do it. Can you hold all of this stuff in your head, Yvonne? No, there's a, like, I, apparently, like, I, I'm not even sure what I'm flying around with there, but I definitely can't. Looks like there's a house that's flying up at the top there. I'm not sure, but no, absolutely not. And uh, uh, I, 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 I even feel like the, the code that Bilbo Buggins gave our students is a lot of cool. It's a lot really? of cool. It's a lot, a lot of cool. It's, it's a not, lot. It's not, it's not as much as this, but it's a lot. I, I think the, the thing is real. Yeah. So we, we there's uh, one of the things that academics like to do uh, is make laws. And they're just observations. Yep. But but there are these things. So the law of continuing change, uh, any system that represents real-term reality will continue to change and become progressively less useful in that environment. Uh, the law of increasing complexity. Every time you add a new piece of functionality to a piece of software, well, you've just added more code to it. It got yeah. bigger. Yeah. And the law of conservation of organizational stability. Uh, basically, uh, it doesn't matter how big you are, everything is kind of con constant. Uh, so you could add more people to a, a team. The, the, love, the number of features that are going to be pushed out is kind of linear. Doesn't yeah. actually represent. Uh, but what what are these things actually saying? These laws. Yeah, you know it's interesting. I'm, I was just thinking about ways in which there's been contributions from our own area and other areas on this. I mean, there's a Greek philosopher uh, Heraclitus that said that the only thing that was real was change, hmm. <laughs> and yet it's a law of software evolution. So I think it's nice that we're consistent with the Greek philosophy yeah. here. Um, but I think, I do think the thing, uh, and, and even, sorry, just to mention to Fred Brooks and the Mythical Man Month and adding people to a late project name, <laughs> you know, is, is maybe one that sort of, there, so there's lots of laws and some of them might even contradict each other. But I think the big thing here is that we can, say some things about our discipline and about the things that we create that are truths. You know, there'll be exceptions, but there's truths. Mm -hmm. It's not chaos. 
the chaos controlled comes. Controlled chaos. It's controlled chaos. <laughs> well, that's the that's the whole point of all of these processes, is that there is. I mean, chaos is, is, a, is a strong word. It was deliberately chosen to make you think about this, but there's change. I think yeah. change is more. more. Yeah. I mean, if, if you find yourself working in a chaotic environment, you should probably think of finding another right. job. Not a stress, but a, 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 a level of change that is uh, something that if you embrace it, like you said, it's very exciting. Yeah. But if you don't like it, if it feels like chaos, it's not, it's really, it's adhering to a bunch of, Really predictable kind of yeah. scenarios, uh, and uh, and and hopefully you can get yourself into a place where this change is fun and not threatening and yeah. not scary and not. Yeah. So there, there's a there there. Well, thankfully, this this particular process doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, you remember the company called Zynga? They did a lot of Facebook games and yeah. stuff like that. So they 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 ended up. Uh, in a situation where they had product managers, they were trying to optimize the amount of money that people spent on their games. Right. They were doing 35 releases a day. And it was grueling because basically every one of those releases has some testing and they're just changing these small parameters yeah. to, uh, to, to optimize that feedback loop from I'm, I'm clicking, 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 paying, clicking, 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 paying. Yeah. Uh, and the uh, I, I knew some people that worked there. Yeah. They left because it was just chaos. It was uncontrolled chaos uh, oh. intended to make as much money as possible. Wow. Uh, and fortunately, that, that particular period in game development and software development has gone away, yeah. uh, primarily because regulation and also um, developers are just walking with their feet and walking out and saying, I don't want to do this anymore. Thank goodness they were walking. Yeah. More laws. Oh my gosh. Yeah, okay, so yeah. Um, uh, this idea that um, we've got uh, conservation of familiarity. So what's going on with that one? Uh, basically, um, in order to um, maintain something, you have to know it. Yeah. So, uh, and, and so I, I, I'm in a position where I, I know all of the couch sheet software. Yeah. Um, but if I were to come back to it six months from now, after the students had worked on it for several iterations, I wouldn't be capable of, of, of working with it because I wouldn't be familiar with it anymore. Yeah. And this this idea of, um, you know, when you give me a new update of Windows or Word or some product and you change you know it, you moved some buttons or something. I think that's a really big deal. Probably the older I get, the bigger deal it is. It's like um, uh, uh, we need to build on what we already are familiar with, and we want to keep that familiarity. Yeah. Um, and that's gonna that's gonna bode well for us when we do that. I think. Yeah. I think that. There was uh, one of the um, uh, one of the early um, people that worked at Apple. The person her surname was Joy, uh, and she. Basically, as far as I know, she basically made the default menus in the Mac to be file with print in the same place. Yeah. Now, every time I get a new Windows update, I have to find the print button. Because oh, they move it everywhere. Yeah, and I do. I try to go between uh, a sort of a, a Mac and a PC a lot just so that I can serve familiarity. <laughs> try okay. to already expand. Okay, so story. the first law here says if you're not familiar with it, can't support it. The yeah. second one says, in order to keep your customers happy, you have to change it. Yeah, you got and uh, and, and uh, add new things. Are these conflicting growth, with each growth, other? Growth. Well, I think that there is there is a little bit of like when we're talking about user interfaces. Uh, once we've got that familiarity baked in, we can consistently uh, introduce new things that are are really aligned with what that familiarity has given us. So we're building on top of it. But growth and growth and growth of new features and new buttons come in and new everything like our assignment, new buttons are coming in. Uh, I don't I don't think it's, I mean, maybe there's a little bit of, uh oh, we want to be familiar, but that doesn't mean we cannot grow. I think that's really, I mean, the, the takeaway here is there is no escaping that it grows or it dies. Right. But you have these two things that are kind of competing with each other. Mm -hmm. In order to have a nice, stable product, you have to know it really well. Yeah. In order to keep your customers, it can't be a stable product anymore. It has to change. Yeah. And then this last one. 
of the defining, of the declining quality. I think this is something where there's lots of wonderful lessons to be learned here. And I do think it does come down to the fact that the growth and the way that it's done, but I'll defer to you on this, you know, when you can have multiple teams, they've divided up the product so that they're actually working on their own parts of things. And then when they get really big, they divide again and divide again and divide again. And we can have this modularity, no doubt. And certainly the Mythical Man Month tells the story of, oh, we have this unintended interactions between these components that we're mm -hmm. trying to separate. So this dependency from this one thing over here with this one thing over here and that other thing over there means that we're starting to have this, this nice modular decomposition break down. Mm -hmm. And once we start breaking that down, we really can't handle that growth that well. Right. And oh my gosh, the declining quality then. Oh. Yeah, in, um, in 2021, when I joined Banana Tag, uh, best company name ever, um, mm -hmm. they've, uh, there were six teams they were all working on one code base and every release that they were putting out was making the customers really angry because it was full of bugs, it was breaking yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. And so we found ourselves in that the, the product managers had been pushing on that second one. Okay. Continued growth, more features, more features. Yeah. So they were adding features left, right and center. And, then, and so what, what I did, the first thing I did when I stepped into that role, I looked at it and I said, we have 30 engineers who are about to quit because they don't like their job because it's all breaking. They're being woken up in the middle of the night to fix it. And so I went to the product managers. And I said, you're getting no features this quarter. Yeah. Not, not a single one. We're hardening our software. We're going to yeah. invest in unit tests, integration tests, and making sure that our releases can actually go as planned as opposed to being broken. So yeah. you actually, you, you want your leadership. At some point in your future, you'll be in positions of leadership and you will be making these decisions, yeah. but you want to work for leaders who are actually looking at and understand all of these things. The, the whole point of these three, these three things and this one here is that they're all fighting with each other. Yeah. Uh, there, there's, there's, there's no single path that goes through there. Yes, and I liked that point that, that you made and it's really amplified in this line that unless it is rigorously maintained and adapted to operational environment changes yeah. and you had to put the brakes on all of this growth awesome. to be able to do that maintenance and you certainly can't afford that for a lot of software. <laughs> well, that, that was a fun meeting because I was in a meeting with the VP of product. Yeah. And I was explaining to this person that we were going to actually invest in a stability. Yeah. And I got a text from someone that said, our latest release just broke again. Yeah. And yeah. so my reply in that meeting was, we are freezing releases for the next three months. And I told the VP of product, you're getting no features because we're fixing everything because it just broke again. Yeah. And the fact that it had just broken it was where I was able to talk to her and say, yes, this is the way it's going to happen because we can, because she was really mad at me because my team was breaking everything. Yeah. And so I'm like, well. It, it was a law that it would decline in quality. <laughs> it was a law. It was the law. It was the law. <laughs> um, okay, so software process models. A software process model is an abstract representation of a process. Uh, it, I don't know why I have fours there. I think, I think they were bullets. I think they were pretty bullets, pretty yeah. bullets, and then it became a four. I think that's where we went from PowerPoint to Google Slides. Oh, that could be. Yeah. This is a rigorously maintained is what we're talking yeah. about here. <laughs> okay, so, I love this. So the, the software process model, we're going to talk about the waterfall model, the incremental model, the evolutionary model, and the agile model. And at the end of all of that, we're going to tell you there is only one model for software development which is the agile one with different time scales. Yeah, I think, yeah. and so we, you can fast forward in the video right now. No, no, don't, because <laughs> you'll miss a joke from Yvonne. Uh, so um, when software development first started, they looked at how big projects were managed Fair. and they said, oh, big projects have a big specification time and then they go implementation and then they go validation and then they're done. They go, yep. that's, how you, that's how you build a bridge. Maintenance. That's yep. how you build a building, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, and so 
uh, they, they, they went into this. And so because other engineering, um, more very stable engineering uh, fields like civil engineering, like we're building bridges pretty much the same way the Romans did. Oh, Different yeah. materials, but yeah, it's yeah, the yeah. same. Yeah. Not, nothing's, not much has changed. We have better materials, but the better. but the engineering that goes behind making sure a bridge yeah. doesn't fall down. Physics. Physics. Yeah. So um, this is what the big project. I think the pyramids were probably like this too. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I, 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 I want I want a big tomb for myself. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, where do you, I want it bigger than the last one? Yeah. My father had one that was this big. I want this this big. Yeah, exactly. And so then you said, well, can we afford it? Can we make the entire Egyptian population poor when yeah. we build this? Yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah they did. Uh, and then there's a requirement you went through. But I don't think they stopped halfway through building a pyramid to go, hey, let's not make it this shape. Let's make it this shape. <laughs> We're actually going to not put the pointy bit on the top. <laughs> It's just going to be I, a condo. I think there was probably some debates about where to hide the tunnels. <laughs> probably, yeah, yeah. yes, yeah. But, and maybe that, yeah, that, you know, you can tell when they're building a road, like the road to Whistler, you can tell that they're going along and then, whoa, we couldn't blow that rock out. <laughs> or there's a house there that wouldn't sell. <laughs> oh, there's that, oh, yes. So so you'll, you'll hear a lot about the waterfall model. The waterfall model is, is, is something that was, it was tried. There's never, there's no official waterfall model, but this is how people were trying to build big systems because they didn't understand the chaos that would ensue when you're changing. Like especially with with computers back in the day when this was being practiced, you know, IBM would release a new computer once a year, which would be twice as powerful as one last year. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And then they or a new language would come out and stuff like that. Nowadays, uh, uh, you know, you're working on one. A front end system, you're using React, and then all of a sudden someone comes along and says, Yeah, we don't want to use that, we want to use Django. Yeah. Oh, okay, so all these things change. So, but, anyways, means, but, yeah. but what we need you to look at is look at this you have feasibility, requirements, implementation, testing, operation, and maintenance. Yeah. This is, you're going to see this again and again. Maybe, do you think it might turn into a circle? Well, I don't know how you go back to feasibility from operation maintenance, but maybe. But I do one thing on that uh, uh, progression there that uh, students might be wondering, and you know, is that we talk about test-driven development, um, uh, and and that it is there, you know, that that we're doing our our testing. Uh, maybe I think maybe because it is. Well, I guess. It's really hard to say where the implementation comes into this diagram, maybe. But anyway, I think I think yeah, this isn't a throwaway. This no, is no. this is this is no no. This, the, this yeah. is what the, the all of these things need to happen. Well, and I think students doing assignments in school um, actually are sort of given requirements definition, and they do this. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 in many cases, as an engineer. Even as a senior engineer, yeah. you will be given the requirements. Yeah, you're, you're, we're, you know, we, we we ask you to be a product manager. We ask you to be a designer. But in reality, you may end up on a team where there is actually a full-time product manager who's bringing yeah. the personas of the clients to the table. Yeah, and they will be providing you with the feasibility analysis, the requirements, definition. Your mm -hmm. senior engineer okay. will look at the system and software design. And then you're going to be looking kind of what the component, yeah. but but the team itself has to draw this out and figure out who's responsible for each part. Yeah, and I think what I love about it too is I think in handing out assignments, at least in my experience, I always uh, feel like when a student comes back and goes, well, but I don't know how to like I, it's not clear what this part means. I feel like that's always such a great thing for people to notice yeah. and to say, well, that's where you get to make some decisions. It's not in the requirements, but you know you have to do something about it. How are you going to do something about it? What are you going to do about it? What are the trade-offs? That's where it gets interesting, I think. So requirements analysis and definition, I, they, we repeat things here, but that's that's fine. In different fonts, the launch. Yeah, we do, of course, yeah. Now we have question marks instead of force. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so the feasibility said in most projects that you work on, the feasibility study will be done by someone other than you. Yeah. That'll be someone who knows the business, someone who understands the market, someone who understands the, the competitive products, what's the niche. 
uh, and then the, the requirements analysis definition, you may participate in that. But in many cases, this entire phase will not be with you. Yeah, unless you're in a startup, startup. or you decide to do a course for uh, community-driven software development. <laughs> uh, who's teaching that? I don't know. I, I've heard she's very good. <laughs> I, 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 hear, I, I see that as well. Uh, and then integration and system testing. Uh, you want to... Uh, we, we've talked a little bit about testing and this kind of where we're weaving that into the course. The next, uh, the next kind of uh, work work session is going to be learning how to use React to test uh, the the front end. That means we're testing an in, in, an integration with the, with the whole back end, with the whole rendering. Uh, but test, test, test. Wherever you can do testing, do testing. Um, but once you do all the testing, you give it to the client. Are we done? Oh, yeah, I don't think we're done yet. And I think, you know, again, this is sort of breaking up into that uh, verification and validation sort of, and again, you could use different terms, but that. How about acceptance that, testing? That, There's another term. Oh, my gosh. There's another <laughs> one. Accept oh, yeah. Look at that. I love this because, you know. I think there's so much, and I think we could do a whole course based on just testing. Um, but I really love this idea that testing isn't just, okay, I got my unit tests or my integration tests done, that it's really going to go in some kind of a, hey, all of a sudden, we're out there, um, not just doing our, val our validation, but our verification. Oh, now I'm getting them mixed up, but with our customers. So this is a verification is where you say, hey, is this what we're trying to build? Validation yeah. is where we go. Yeah. So this is all validation, the whole thing. No, you got friendly set of customers there. Yeah, we're validating that they that the friendly ones are happy. I think it's a bit of verification in there too, or at least I think the customers are thinking or are, well, are this at is, the level of the requirements. Not well, so well, much we're, that. we're validating that we built the right thing. Okay, so this isn't about getting bugs? No, this is about getting bugs, but it's validating right. that we built the right thing. Okay. That is, is, is bug free. Bug free right? and what you wanted. Yeah. So, so we have, okay, we, we built these unit tests. The alpha testing is a system by the development team. So I need a file. Uh, I need a function that reads a file from the MongoDB file and reads it into memory yeah. and puts it and makes it available to all these classes. I can test that independent of any users. Absolutely, and, then, and you don't want to put it in users' hands if you don't know that that works. And then, yeah. then beta testing, I, I spin up a live site, yeah. and I have this one customer, or well, friendly one, friendly one who's engaged and, and they want to be part of this whole process. But they know maybe the maybe we've cut them a deal; they get five percent off what yeah. you pay us. Uh, but they and they're involved, and they will help us, uh, and their feedback will be critical, but not oh my God, we're going to walk away from this, we're not paying you anymore, because right. they understand the software development. Uh, and then acceptance testing is you're building software for uh, you know, an NGO, uh, and they you need, okay, this, this, here's the software. They say, well, actually, we did want it to be in five languages. You only did it in English. Oh, we, maybe we could have figured that out earlier. We could have, yeah. I don't know, yeah. Or maybe they changed their mind and said, well, we did say two languages, it's actually 17. Yes. Well, and yeah, it's not even changing their mind. There's just more uh, users that want it or something. More data, but, more data. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, when you, it's always when you, when people are saying, yeah, I'm testing this out, it's in beta right now, though. But I think that's a, oh, they got the insider view of what's going on if you've got something that's in beta. Yeah. So what cool. company is eternally in beta? Beta? Google. <laughs> All of Google's products are in beta. And well, all... I, wait a minute. That's, it's that's Microsoft kind of... too. No? Well, they're, they're from what I've heard from yeah. some of the work there was that their internal mo oh. internal model is we're always in beta because okay. we always want to be better. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. About meta and beta. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, we want you as a you know think about it the waterfall model. What are the advantages? What are some of the disadvantages? Uh, we'll see if we can weave this into the next lecture, but as a team, as you're getting together to work on assignments and stuff like that, talk about the waterfall model. In particular, you have a project you have to plan out. Are you going to plan out the entire project of this, or are you going to iterate on it and you're going to go use some of the techniques that are just about to come in the presentation now? Yeah, and it's not about a project for a course because those tend to be fully 
specced for you yeah. and handed to you. It is really about a project for your company, your startup company, or taking on something at work. It's this is this is the real world type project. So advantages, uh, you can see the whole process visibility. Uh, in the disadvantages, it's it's it's. It's assuming nothing's going to change. So that inflexible partitioning of the project means it's a very academic term for saying you're trying to do everything at once and things may change. Yeah. And uh, again, it's so, it's so funny. Change is so great. And yet uh, in most of your classes, understandably, the work that you've been doing has been based on creating something from a waterfall model. Oh, yeah. and and. Uh, I mean, we would, uh, one of the things I'd like to figure out is how to change an assignment halfway through, and then you guys would be furious. Oh, I do it all the time. <laughs> uh, so what is it well suited for? Well, uh, uh, it's, those fours are really throwing me off. Yeah, I know. Therefore, the model is only appropriate for, basically, if you understand and there's no changes, you can go ahead and plan. And, and when we talked at the beginning about chaos management, this is where we talk about chaos management. If I know that there's no change or change management, if there's no change for this project for the next 18 months, if, and I know for sure 100% that the customer is gonna go, yep, that's, that's what I wanted, then I can actually put my head down and work on it for 18 months and be yeah. done with it, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's it really is only useful for large systems that aren't going to change, that have a lot of, uh, even a lot of those things change because technology is going to change. Even if the customer doesn't change their mind, all of a sudden there's a brand new way of doing things. Oh yeah, oh my goodness, a lot of times that kind of stuff happens. And I think it's just that um, that waterfall model might actually be at the level of a very, um, uh, high level, large, organized project that's worth billions of dollars. I mean, they're still gonna be in the budget, millions of dollars of things mm -hmm. shifting around, but generally speaking, getting the sense of, and it's very hard for software projects, especially if you've got a startup, how do you scope what the cost of a project is? And you kind of have to do that with the client at the start. Yeah. It can't always be changing. So there are ways in which this is definitely giving us good hints for high level representation of a project. Right, so this is the one end of the extreme where things yeah. don't change for a long time. And if, you, if you're lucky enough to work on one of those projects, they actually can be a lot of fun because you can just put your head down, you work and you get it done. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> we're actually trying to build software now, the problem is that someone comes along and says, I need something that gets me from A to B. Yes. Right? Yeah. And that's all the customer said. Yeah. And so you go, oh, okay, I'm going to build a skateboard. Yeah. Because if you go back to them and say, I have a wheel, I have two wheels, you still can't drive. It's, you know, the top line, number one, can you drive? No. Number two, can you drive? No. Number three, maybe, I don't know. But that doesn't look like it's a steering wheel. Oh, I see. There's no steering wheel on that. Number That's four. Yeah. So number one, like, okay, skateboarding. I actually never learned how to ride a skateboard because I'm I'm too clumsy. But number two, I can actually ride. I can hold on to oh, the front of it. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but but number one can actually get a lot of people from A to B. I enjoyed skateboarding as a kid. I knew you would. I did. <laughs> but I wasn't any good at it. I fell a lot, but you know. <laughs> Uh, and then eventually the customer gets to a car. It's a convertible. It's actually nicer. It's actually a better version of number three. Yeah, it really is. This has got just basically it's true, and it's got a windshield to keep those bugs out of your eyes. And I feel like that customer helped with the development of that final incarnation with a little bit of feedback along the line. Versus, there's not a lot of customer feedback seemingly happening between one, two, and three on the top line. It's just, I am not happy. And then, okay, I'm but not. it's like, I, no, I no go on that first one, but I could live with that. I could live with number three. I'm pretty happy with number four, but look at how excited I am about yeah. number five. It, it also looks like it's an age appropriate thing. There's your 10 year old, yes. 12 year old. Yeah. Now, there you go to university on a bicycle, then you can afford a motorbike. Oh, and yeah. then, then you realize that's too dangerous and you buy a car because you've got kids and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
So, you, so one of the things you'll hear, so if we go back to this, the skateboard is a minimal viable product for getting someone from A to B. Certainly is. You, some people would love it. Oh yeah, yeah. I because know. cost effective, no pollution, can bring it into the building without getting yelled at. Like there's a lot to love there. For some people, that client, it was not the right answer for that client. But if you throw an electric motor on that, that's awesome. <laughs> well, if you were the client, I don't know about person here. Yeah. So, so, but basically minimal viable product means it's a piece of software that's actually running. Uh, uh, so on yeah. this first one here, we didn't really get a running product until number three yeah. on the top. Yeah. On the bottom one, we engaged with the customer and we said, here's a skateboard. What do you think? Look, you can go from A to B. And they go, well, actually, I want a little bit more control. Yeah. Okay, we'll put a handle on it. It's still a running vehicle. Yeah. So when you look at this particular slide here, uh, the light blue, this kind of cyan color here, that's what you've built. And the area of this thing here is how much money you've spent. Yeah. So you've got a, you've got this functional thing here, but it's not reliable, not usable, and yeah, you know you could probably stand in front on one wheel. Actually, there's one wheel vehicles now. <laughs> right. Well, and that's the unicycle. Like, yeah. No. I, I I like the like on like in that little diagram. I think that diagram is really helpful this one? in the sense that yeah, I I think this is really nice because there's also an element of emotional design yeah. in here with the reactions from this client, this particular client. Yeah. So what what we what this minimal viable product we're trying to give people uh, customers that experience of what it's going to be like to be in this system. Mm -hmm. Now, the, this uh, project you're working on in New Vic, in New Vic with the, 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 the interaction space, what was your first kind of prototype look like? <laughs> we still have it. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> and it, it's kind of like this though, right? It's a spin right up to the top. I would say, I mean, you know, this we ended up throwing this big uh, green tarp <laughs> as a green screen and had lots of cameras. And absolutely. I think, I think that we could all, we know what the vision was and we know we could start to experience, you know, where we'd go if we had more money. But yeah, I think it was, I think that we really, at the, finally, I mean, there was a lot of times where we weren't getting anywhere, but I think we got that slice right. in there and everyone got excited because we could see the vision right. of where it could go. Right, and you got there as soon as you had that emotional reaction. It was emotional. It totally was emotional, yes. So here we go, we go back to waterfall design. Uh, this this is a meme that, that actually originated back in the 60s. Uh, it talks about what the client wanted, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but basically, uh, the client wanted a swing from the tree. Uh, and so um, the, the team goes away here, says, oh, we want to swing on that tree. OK, well, let's put a pillar here, a pillar here, and put the swing in between the two. And you go on that swing and bonk, you bang your head on there. I feel like this, this picture, and I have seen it a lot, was created by someone who really didn't like waterfall because <laughs> I'm not sure that people who maybe actually because it's not that waterfall falls nothing um, uh, would agree that this is a fair way. Yeah I don't think anyone would actually think that that one is on the right. I think it's it's there's a different meme which is about what, what the you know, customer wanted. Yes. Et cetera, et cetera. But anyways yeah. uh, since we're on this page we could talk look at that second one. The client wanted a swing on this tree there's the first one, you can swing on it, second one, third one, fourth one, and then finally, there's one with a nice little cushion on it. Uh, you can sit on it, enjoy uh, a little nice swing in a sunset, and off you go. It looks lovely. And I think that that's where now we're, we're seeing this connection, too, between these phases in Agile and Waterfall. Right being about different levels of granularity and being able to repeat as right. opposed to all or nothing at every level. Yeah. And, and what's interesting is that the fallacy of waterfall comes from you build a building and what do you do? You pack up your crew and you leave. Yeah. There's no redesign of that building. 
Yeah. But with software, we can always go back and change any particular aspect of that process. It's all fungible, and fungible is a word that means changeable, that you can you can rearrange it. And, and one of the reasons we get into so much trouble with software engineering is we can't actually go and change anything we want. Yeah. It costs money, oh, yeah. but you can do everything. And so instead of building these big buildings where you're done and you walk away, and even if it's a horrible building, you still walk away from it, we're going to build smaller components of that building a little bit at a time, and then we're going to evaluate it. So if you look at that, we have our, uh, our backlog, which is just a list of requirements, yeah. which we have there. We analyze it, we define it, we design it, we test it, we deploy it, and then we test and we keep going around. That's the whole point of Agile, is that you're basically doing many waterfalls back to back. Yeah, I think, Keeping that in mind, you know, really helps us understand the value of both. Yeah. Um, and I feel like there are some confusing things when you go and look at this and some of the representations of this. And and again, I think I was noting before that I thought that testing was coming earlier. Now testing's coming after the implementation and we talk about testing or blah, 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 blah. That's minor. What we're talking about is how do you develop the software? And we know that it's that it's really for our students, unless they're involved in a very large organized project. Yeah. Da, da, da. This is the mindset that you want is that this is good. Right. This is really good. Um, but it, it feels strange at first mm -hmm. because it means that you may pivot entirely. Oh, absolutely. But if we go back to that first slide that was all about, uh, you know, no market, you need to pivot if there's no market for what you're building. So yeah, yeah. mitigating risk. So as we said, every every release is a, a mini waterfall. Yeah, and sometimes this is referred to specifically as incremental development. Yeah. yeah. What is agile software development? Well, the only constant is change. Who was this person that Heracletus. said that? Heracletus. Says Great that. philosopher. Not <laughs> way before any programming was out there, people. <laughs> so the incremental development, agile, extreme programming, Scrum, Kanban, every yeah. there's probably by the time we finish this lecture, there'll be a new one that came out that oh, someone has proposed. Right here. Right there. <laughs> it just happened. It's just, it just happened. right behind us now. Yeah. Yes. So um, the idea is uh, build a the core idea of Agile is always have something running. Yeah, always that have feels something. good That's as it. a programmer too. Like I always, I love it. Like I'll, I'll just, I'll just do see printf, you know, I'll just, hello. Yeah. I just always like to well, know. That, and that, well, that's why the first, if any language that you have now has the hello world program for that language, because yeah. it actually feels good it does. to get it there. Uh, it was actually the first program in the first C pro textbook. Yeah, and oh. incredibly satisfying. Incredibly yeah. satisfying. Oh, I think, are we done? <laughs> well, that'll be it. <laughs> oh, well, it's very extreme, as you saw, because parts of this did not load. It's that extreme. Right. So basically, uh, we had some, so so a whole bunch of people met in Utah a while back, and they were protesting these large projects that were being late, and engineers were suffering because everything was mismanaged, and they came out of that with this idea of agile, and there's, I said before, there's a whole bunch of um, different implementations of Agile. Uh, extreme programming is one, it, it rose, it kind of led the way for Agile programming and then it kind of fell to the side a little, bit. a little bit. People aren't doing that, so we'll skip on that one. Uh, so what is Agile software development? It's easily moved, it fits the process of the project. So I had the privilege of working on the core demo for Honeycomb, yeah. which was uh, um, uh, uh, a spreadsheet-based computational model, and we were working with Adam Bosworth, and we had one, every day he would change his mind about what we were gonna do. Oh. And there was myself, Anton Semenovsky in San Francisco, he was doing the front end, I was doing the back end. We would meet with Adam at nine in the morning, and we'd both sit at our computer and program 
six and a half hours, get something up and running. We show it at 5.30 that afternoon, and Adam would say, yeah, that's not what I wanted. And then he would go home and think, and we would go home day. and sleep. And I don't think he slept at all during this project. And so then we would come back the next day and do that same thing. So basically, every day things were changing, so we had an agile process that was very quick, very nimble. Right. So and it wasn't just... Wow, it was really every day. Every day. It was a new project. For four weeks, for four weeks, every day. And, and i have never thrown so much code out in my life, yeah. right? It's like we, we actually stopped using Git. <gasps> we were just cowboying it all the way through. And uh, we got it. But we, we didn't want to waste any time because we were exploring ideas. At the end of those four weeks, we had a decision, this is what we're building, and we all went, ah. So then I went and hired a team of 10 people, Anton hired a 10, 10 people, and we all switched to two-week sprints. Nice. Yeah. So it's that frequency. Yeah. Like, it's it's when do you, you know, the size of a sprint, would you normally go any longer than two weeks in a sprint? Uh, I've, I've had teams that go four weeks. Four weeks. And so that means fewer meetings, yep. maybe. Or, but do you do your daily stand-up? We do or, a daily stand-up. But, 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 but we not keep a it, big team. We, yeah, we meeting. keep it to 15 minutes. Yeah, so to, so yeah. Probably. Okay. What are you doing today? I'm, I'm, I'm working on the same stuff. I yeah. think I'll be finished. Or I'm in trouble. I really need help. Someone help me. Yeah. Or I don't have time to work on this at all. See you tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that might happen in your team meetings, but you guys are all in teams. We really would uh, suggest that you have daily stand-ups. doesn't have to be more than 15 minutes. It can be on Zoom or Teams or whatever. But uh, getting into the habit of a daily stand-up, good idea. Um, why Agile? I think we've covered this because software has to evolve quickly to reflect changing business needs. I don't think we need to say anything else there. Yeah, I th I really think that there's it's kind of a it's even this the way that this is presented it's kind of a um, maybe they all knew where we were going with yeah. this before we got here so not a big surprise we're not going to be having exams where you have to remember all this but just sort of to be able to embrace it maybe um, and be happy with a job that allows you to experience yeah. the ability to go wait a minute. It's, is a better idea based on what the client just told us. I think one of the things about Agile that I thought was really interesting when I was first learning about it, and I don't know that it's in, certainly there's different types of Agile, but is that you know getting that client in frequently to check in on yep. what's going on and have some client feedback about you know what they absolutely and, valuable. And opening it up for them to change everything. Yep. You know. Holy cow, is that uh, something you're excited about or is that something you're dreading? Hopefully you're the kind of person that you can go like, okay, well, I need to manage this, but I do find it exciting. Yeah, well, and, and uh, if you're going to be in a highly agile environment, you need to have a management infrastructure in place that will reward you, even if you have to throw your code out. Right. Right. And so it doesn't that, look that, like progress. Crucial. Doesn't look like progress. Ooh, and, yeah. and if you work at, so, and so here's another advantage of agile, yeah. is if I work away, if my sprints are two weeks long, that means I've probably got eight days worth of work, one day at the beginning, one day that are gone. Uh, so I've just spent eight days working on a feature. I got it done. It's all ready to go. And then the product manager comes in and says, we're changing our mind. We don't need that anymore. Ooh. I, I have two weeks where they paid me, yeah. but I worked on something, and it's not going to be part of the product, but it's different than working for six months on a product and then being told they don't need it. Yeah. And that's, the whole, that's one of the advantages as an engineer, that when they change their mind, I haven't lost six months worth of work. And my chance of promotion is still there because yeah. I'm agile and I can actually deliver. Because a lot of companies want to see your code in production. Oh, yeah. So if I your know. code doesn't get into production. You're never making it. Yeah, exactly. You're never so, getting it. So it, it, is, it, is, uh, it, it is part. And, but the thing is, it's, it's still not universal. And there's still teams that are struggling to implement this sure. uh, just because there's so many characters in play and so many uh, requirements flying around and so much change. And, and you actually, uh, you know, the, the worst mistake you could make is say, we've implemented this variety of Agile and we're not going to change. 
because then you're not oh. agile. Oh my gosh, how ironic. Absolutely. You weren't being agile about your agile. Right, and and in, in uh, companies that I've worked where they have scrum, yeah, it's become a religion. Yeah. Where it's like, well, this isn't proper scrum thing. And I'm like, oh my. Agile means you use the best process possible for the situation that you find yourself in. Yeah. And if scrum ain't working for you, yeah. then you walk away from it. You suck that kabam, or, uh, which is very different process, but it's still agile. Yeah. It just has very different metrics and yeah. ways of measuring it. Yeah. The reason scrum has become so popular is because it has uh, measures that managers can obsess over, yeah. even though uh, yeah, the velocity yeah. charts and burn down charts and all that stuff, yeah. they actually, in most cases, don't add any value at all. No. Yeah. They, but they give outside managers a sense of control yeah. that is not real. Well, and I think these Kanban boards um, uh, for project backlogs and that kind of stuff, there's a lot of value there. People might want to look into this and start to use it yeah. within the course as tools. And that oh, the, the, the back, so um, managing change, absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. Managing your backlog, which is the, the things that you're going to work on next, that's why you want your product manager and your customer to agree on it. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, because you want to, whatever version of Agile you have, the next iteration you go into, you need to know what you're doing. And if you can trust your PM and your manager to give you these are the things that are important, you can yeah. just go into that meeting without your PM and without your manager and say, okay, I'll take this, I'll take this, I'll take this, okay, we're off to go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Very nice. The Agile Manifesto, uh, and this is this is where Scrum religion breaks down. It's individuals and interactions over processes. Scrum is not a process. Scrum is a methodology that's intended to help you be yeah. agile. It's not the goal. No. It's a tool. Yeah. Uh, working software always, if you can, if you can finish every sprint or every day with software that runs, even if it's got placeholders in it, like Bilbo Buggins did with yeah. the, the, the times and all of those codes there, yeah. it was working. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't I think Bilbo did a lot of comprehensive documentation, nope. but that's okay because the code was working. And also, we have really good students who can go engineer some right. of the design documents. Uh, and when I release a less fuzzy version of debugging, <laughs> fuzzy logic. Fuzzy logic. Yeah. <laughs> I actually figured out how to do that today. Um, customer collaboration over contract negotiation in, in that old waterfall model uh, uh, when the project was running late. There would be these horrible meetings between the developer and the customer saying, well, you know, uh, we're facing an overage and we need another $3 million to ship this. Yeah. And uh, whereas if you have that conversation earlier, say, hey, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to do the 73 features that you need. Uh, can we give you these five? Uh, and I've been in those conversations. It's a lot easier the earlier you can do that, yeah. these, because then they can go back to their people and go, well, you know, this contract that we have doesn't look like they're going to give us everything. But it looks like we can get this and this, but which of these three are the most important and they can come back to us and talk to us. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then responding to change over following a plan. This, this is, as we said before, if you can plan for 11 months and that plan ain't going to change, go waterfall. Yeah. If you know the plan's going to be changing, then respond to change. Yeah. So if you identify how quickly that change is going to happen, it'll tell you how long your sprints or how long your spaces can be. Yeah, and that might even be, you know, that whole, the, the sort of the, boy, I've got a lot of interaction with my, my client. My client is constantly changing everything. Maybe that actually can get a little out of hand, but it does mm -hmm. have to be something that you're managing that too. It's not that you're going to follow the bumblebee. You're going to, you do, uh, you want to respond, but right. you need to be able to manage that too. Yeah, yeah. and, and, Again, you probably will not be doing that as a software engineer at the beginning of your career, right. but you want to be part of a team where someone is doing that. Yeah. Um, Agile methods, uh, it all came out of what we talked about, these large projects getting out of control. Uh, and so the whole, I think we can skip this one before. Don't we? Well, I think so. And I think it was, it's funny. I, I think the, the right thing here is, uh, you know, that, that seems strange to students at first. Limiting documentation. Yep. Uh, principles of agile methods, customer first. Mm -hmm. Customer first, customer first. That's really the only thing you need to remember from this slide. 
Uh, the rest we've all talked about, incremental delivery. Yeah. Uh, have good conversation with your customer. What did I say? Customer first. Yeah. Uh, people not process. We want to make stuff that the customer's excited about. And so uh, I, I work really well uh, from six in the morning till about midday. Yeah. Other team people like starting at midday, oh, and they work late in the night. I don't Summer work. I don't work nocturnal. You know, at night. I, I can't function at night. Yeah. Uh, but how do we structure teams such that that can happen? Yeah. Um, embrace change. Again, we keep coming back to this. We we use the word chaos at the beginning, and sometimes it feels like chaos. If chaos is managed, it feels like managed change. Yeah. And exciting. Yeah. 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 And simplicity. Like one of the one of the big temptations when you're writing code is to engineer for every possible outcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you got to get that code working first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, what, what if what if we what if we want to add like functions to calc sheet that looks like Excel? Yeah. The, yeah, but that's not the point of the whole project. The no. whole project is to have a pointy, clicky type thing so people can interact with it. But we could implement that later. I don't know if we want to. Yeah. So simplicity. Uh, uh, Agile method is applicable to, uh, it's actually applicable to any software development team that is understanding the change that they have to deal with, and then they can adjust their Agile methodology to be that. Uh, yeah, but well, I think sometimes of a great example of teams that have to be Agile and maybe you can sort of feel it is emergency rooms. You know, or, or or something uh, you know that is uh, serving customers. Right. You know, uh, the manager of a restaurant or something like that. But like every day, it's something different is happening, and you got to be able to respond. You don't have to be that agile, but yeah, you want to be able to see what's going on around you and respond. And one of the, the downsides at the very end there is because you're focusing on small teams. Uh, if you're working on a large projects such as S3, which is the biggest hard drive on the planet, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of people that work on that. Yeah. And uh, you know, here in Vancouver, we have the index team. Yeah. And what they do is they have a system that when you ask for a blob from S3, they will figure out where that file is on one of the thousands of computers that are distributed around the world, yeah. and they will do that. And they don't have anything to do with actually copying files off that machine over to there. Just so finding it. They just find it. Yeah. Uh, uh, when I left Amazon, there was over 15 trillion files on S3. Whoa. Um, again, so there's there because you're iterating, uh, if you're working with a customer who just wants to say build it and go away, it's yeah. difficult to engage them. Uh, it is uh, intense uh, because of the change. Uh, and also, if you have multiple customers, uh, how do you prioritize those changes? But again, this, this, none of this here necessarily applies to you as an engineer because people should be managing this for you. But yeah. you do need to be comfortable with change. So that yeah. second one does apply to you. Uh, but maintaining simplicity requires extra work. Yeah, that's, that's really a what, surprise. It's always a surprise. Writing yeah. simple code is harder than writing complex code. Yeah. yeah, it is. It is. It totally is keeping it simple. And I think the the other place where people in our class might get exposed to some of this stuff, like you said, there'll be lots of big organizations where this is done for you. But when you are a small team working on a project for a, you know, either a startup or a nonprofit organization, you got to take all this into account. Your your contract. Well, one of my <laughs> one of my favorite things that I heard when I joined a company, I had this. They had just gone through the Scrum training, yeah. and a product manager, a producer, which in the game industry is a product manager, wow. came up to me and says, "Juancho, the best thing about Agile is that I don't have to plan anymore." Oh my God! Like, no. Yeah. The best thing about Agile is that you can plan over time. Yeah. Right? You, yeah. But you still have, have to a plan. Leave in charge. You got to have a plan. But if you ever join a team where the product manager or the producer say, we're doing Agile so we don't have a plan, hand in your resignation and walk away at that moment. That's not going to control the chaos. Uh, th think about it this way. 
uh, you've got this boat going across the ocean. Yeah. And you got a whole bunch of engineering teams in the boat. Yeah. In particular, there's the engineering team that runs the motor. Okay. Right. And uh, I went. I, I was on a on a boat in Scotland, which was built in 1905, and it has this massive steam engine there. Wow. And there's four people on the boat that are running the steam engine. And you can watch them do it. Yeah. But they can't see out the window. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So they can. Their, their job is to maintain the engines. So they're like a little agile team. Yeah. And they've got to put oil in here and do all of this stuff. But the captain makes the decision of how fast this boat's going to go. Yeah. She makes the decision of what speed we're going to go, what direction, when to slow down. Yeah, don't all hit the, something. Yeah, but <laughs> and the, the thing is, and this, so that's the thing, you do need someone to plan. Uh, my previous company, we had a chief product officer he did not plan. He wanted. He didn't. He didn't. And the reason he didn't want to plan was he didn't want to take the responsibility. No. So he's like, yeah, I'm going to push it down. And, yeah. and the problem is, nobody knew what was expected. So everyone was like cats running all over the place. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. I think we're. I think we're. I think we're, we're wrapping it up. I think we'll leave this one. I think we've covered this one here. Um, we'll leave it here for ten, nine. Eight. You guys read it. And and honestly, I think that the uh, there's subtle differences here, but um, uh, you know, I I I'm, and we read it. We're gonna. Why don't we start with this slide when we come back together? If we can remember this, when we come back together uh, in a couple of weeks here. Um, some some real things to think about because it even has to do with the personalities on your team. Oh, absolutely. Oh yeah, you, it, there are some people that do not like changing what they're doing every two weeks. Absolutely, and, and they can still participate in yeah. agile software development. But, but, but there's, a special, there's a special, there's a special, but that there's a requirement for managing them because they will get all freaked out about, yes. oh, this is all changing stuff like that. Yes. Uh, there's also people who love change so much. Too much. It's too much. They just. Yeah, uh, I think that'd be me. Right. Um, very, very long sentence. Uh, the slides are available. You can read this by yourselves. Yeah, I think that we're sort of getting it. That agile maybe might not be the only answer out there, but it is the way that software tends to be developed. And so well, I mean, but it does go back to what I what I was saying was there is only one process, which is agile. Yes. And it's just a question of, are you building the whole project in it's, one thing, or are you building different versions yeah. of that project all along? But every one of those cycles results in a project, results in a product. Yeah. It's not the product you sell, yeah. but it's the product you show your customer says, hey, look, now the customer may not come in every two weeks, they may no. come, but the PM who represents the but, product manager who represents the customer can make evaluations. Can make evaluations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Absolutely. there is no such, there is only agile. Yeah. It's whether you have, the whole thing at one shot, yeah. baby steps that take you along the way. Yeah. And there is between all in one or little bits that add up to one, it all depends on what product you're building. Yeah. And I think just the highlights here in bold, like think about the characteristics of the software, who the team is, what the risks are, and the characteristics of the customer. And then you can start to get a sweet spot for mm -hmm. how to dial this in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, waterfall versus incremental versus stage spiral. delivery, spiral, spiral, spiral. hypothesis. You're going to see all of this terminology. Yeah. Uh, again, you, the takeaway from this is we don't know how to do this yet. No. We're figuring it out. But really, you as a team, you as part of a team, you can have opinions. One of the uh, one of my favorite questions that I asked when I was interviewing. Amazon was tell me about a time where you changed the process oh. and the number of times there were engineers who had worked somewhere else and said, you know, we had this particular development philosophy and I advocated for this one. Wow, interesting. And, and how it made it better and stuff like that. And these were all stories of an engineer joining a small team of six or seven people, you know, in some cases, but we don't, we, they weren't doing code reviews. Yeah. So I, I said, we should do code reviews. And, and then people started doing code reviews and things got better. Or we weren't, uh, we were planning for six months, but the PM was coming in and changing 
uh, their mind halfway through the six months, and we didn't have processes in place for that. Yeah. Okay. I that's think, it. I think that's it.